We're running a little behind schedule, so I'm going to try and accelerate um, and run through this quite quickly. Um, as, as Michael and Pavan said, I uh, was responsible for the what we call Deliverable 3, which was trying to translate the science of uh, biodiversity economics into the language of business. Um, I currently work for WWF here in Australia, but uh, the work that I did was when, in my previous job at IUCN, uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature, based in Switzerland. Give credit where it's due. Um, I was going to talk about an overview of, of tea because we weren't sure Pavan was going to get here on time because of his, his airplane trouble. So I'm going to skip all of that and go straight into the business side. So I can skip plenty of slides, which you have already seen. But maybe it's a refresher. OK. Um, so I'll start with, um, the, I guess, the how we translated this into the language of business. And the starting point is looking at impacts. What is the impact of business activity on natural capital, on ecological systems, on bio, biodiversity and the ecosystem services that it delivers? And we have a range of different methods for quantifying those impacts. And those methods have been developed over several decades and are, are reasonably sophisticated and, and reliable. These are uh, a whole toolbox of an environmental economic valuation methods. And interestingly, those methods, um, although previously mainly used by academics and governments, increasingly are being used by business. And uh, you may have seen outside, um, there was a, a document published by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which is a guide to corporate ecosystem valuation, essentially making the case that these these tools of valuing ecosystem services can, be, can and should be used by business. And it's uh, illustrated with, I think, a dozen case studies uh, in which um, my previous employer, IUCN, was also involved. So here's one example at a very macro level of what happens when you apply these kinds of valuation methods to the impacts of business activity on the environment. This was analysis done by True Cost for uh, UN Principles for Responsible Investment using the best available data that, and methods that they had at the time. Um, and as a result, um, they end up with quite a lot of emphasis on greenhouse gas emissions and climate change impacts. Uh, and that's not to say that other impacts are, are small, um, but th mainly that we don't have the data or the methods yet to be able to quantify as well some of those other impacts on uh, biodiversity in particular. So you'll see here that the, uh, the impacts are about greenhouse gases, water, air pollution, natural resources, uh, loosely defined, volatile organic compounds, general waste, and heavy metals. So a, a lot of the, the ecological um, uh, assets and services that Will, for example, was referring to are not captured in, in this kind of analysis. But we're getting better at measuring and quantifying. Even with the ones that they did quantify, it came to something like 11% of, of GDP in damages from business activities. Um, it's not just about negative impacts. Um, business also depends on, relies upon ecosystem services for a, a range of inputs and, and uh, assimilation of waste products. Um, we've already heard about the value of, of pollination services. Um, and there's been some good literature on trying to quantify what that value comes to. It's about 10% of value added in the agriculture sector globally. To some extent, um, that's recognized and paid for. You can rent beehives in some parts of the world in modern agriculture. Um, in other parts of the world, it's invisible. We don't see it. It's, it's reflected in the price of food. It's, it's in the value of what we get in the supermarket, but nobody's paying the bees for, for those services. So it's hidden, although the value is there. Um, we spent a lot of time in, in the Team for Business report trying to make the business case or illustrate the business case. And this is not easy, to say the least. But um, one can point to, for example, consumer demand as a driver of business action on uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. Some of this data is a little out of date now, but essentially um, uh, tracks increasing sales of uh, things like organic food and drink, certified products, uh, eco-labeled fish, and so on. And the point generally is that the markets for these uh, so-called sustainable goods and services is generally growing much faster than conventional markets for goods and services, suggesting that businesses might want to pay a, a bit of attention to that. And I'll come back to that later on. Similarly, um, the public in general is increasingly aware of what's going on. Um, they're uh, aware of uh, uh, environmental change. 
concerned about that and increasingly looking for responses from companies um, uh, to address those problems and claims uh, that they will make purchasing decisions on the basis of, of those concerns. I think in practice, um, consumers often say they'll do things that they don't do when they actually get into the supermarket, but um, that nevertheless, there is a, a, an awareness, a growing awareness and a growing concern there. On the other side, investors are increasingly interested in um, uh, socially responsible uh, business, partly because they want to avoid risk, and partly because um, retail investors, uh, pension fund owners, like everybody in this room presumably, also want to make sure that their, um, their savings, their pension, is supporting responsible business activity. And that can be tracked in various ways. This is from the United States, looking at funds uh, uh, under management with some kind of environmental, social, and governance concern, or community investing concern, or just uh, shareholder advocacy. And it's, again, growing over time. As a consequence of the changes in consumer demand, public awareness, investor pressure, um, more and more businesses are recognizing that they need to pay attention to biodiversity and ecosystem services. Probably the biggest driver is around reputation. Uh, and I think that, in a sense, highlights changes in social norms. It's no longer considered acceptable to do some things today that it used to be acceptable to do. Um, and I, I was thinking um, about Pavan's slide. He had norms as one of the responses to um, biodiversity change. Um, we no longer consider it acceptable to enslave people. We don't consider it acceptable to deny uh, women the vote or jobs or equal pay, although probably there's still some work to be done in that area. We, we don't consider it acceptable to dispose of human bodily waste into the street, right? So the things do change, and I guess the question is, when and how does it become normal to assume that businesses do not destroy nature, that economic activity uh, makes a positive contribution to natural capital rather than continually using it as a free good? Um, and I, interestingly, I came across um, a report uh, by Deloitte, one of the big business service companies, talking about strategies of uh, leading companies towards zero impact growth. And I think maybe that kind of norm needs to um, become mainstream. The idea that businesses not only produce a positive return on financial capital invested, but they produce a positive return on natural capital, on human capital, on all of, of the, um, the inputs that they use. That's an aside. Um, another consequence of the increased demand and, and awareness of course, is increasingly stringent regulations. And we can see this at various levels, from local to national to international. These are the targets that were agreed in Japan in 2010. Um, in a sense, this is a kind of mandate or an agenda for national governments and is slowly being translated into national legislation and is going to imply increasing stringency of, uh, uh, of regulation of environmental impact and increasing difficulty of access to natural resources for businesses, whether it's to do with um, removing harmful uh, subsidies uh, or what are considered, such as uh, subsidies to fossil fuels, uh, reducing land conversion, reducing pressure on marine resources, reducing pollution of, of uh, fresh water, um, greater uh, restrictions on the use of genetic material, um, and increasing demands for finance which is inevitably going to be coming from consumers and the private sector, because that's where the money is. Um, a lot of companies are taking this seriously. Not enough, but a lot of companies are uh, taking action. They are setting targets, measuring, valuing, reporting their impacts and their dependence. They're helping to develop and improve a whole suite of tools, and we'll hear about some of those in the case studies. Um, some of the more far-sighted companies are trying to essentially create new business models. Um, these are businesses that deliver biodiversity benefit or deliver ecosystem services. We're probably mostly familiar with uh, carbon traders or, or carbon offset providers, but there are similar um, initiatives in different parts of the world trying to make a business out of doing the right thing for the environment. Um, and lastly, um, and maybe a bit more controversially, some companies are supportive of market-friendly environmental policy. Um, that turns out to be uh, controversial and difficult, as we see in this country with uh, uh, debates about the, the mineral resource rent tax, for example. It makes sense to shift the burden of taxation away from things that we value, like jobs and value added, 
and towards the things that we want to um, have less of, such as impacts on natural resources or, or use of, of scarce resources. But making that transition from our existing tax regime to an ecologically friendly tax regime turns out to be extremely difficult. Uh, lots of vested interests at stake there. Um, I don't have time, um, because of where we are in the schedule, to go into all the, the uh, examples. Suffice to say that there are many com com companies, as I said, um, who have made public commitments to reduce their impact or even to make uh, a net positive impact. We'll hear from Stuart Anstey of Rio Tinto about what they're doing on biodiversity. Most of the, the targets that have been set are around um, carbon and greenhouse gases, um, but increasingly people are starting to talk about water, biodiversity, habitat, uh, zero impact generally, as in the case of, of, of Sony. Um, I'm going to rush through. I've already talked about the WBCSD valuation guide. You can have a look at the material outside. Okay. Um, I was going to talk also about uh, uh, another leader, Puma, uh, and what they're doing on quantifying and, and disclosing their environmental footprint. But I gather we're going to have a case study in the afternoon after lunch by Michael Chen from PwC, who will go into more detail about how companies can measure and, and quantify and report in, in financial terms their impacts on the environment. What I just wanted to highlight in, in this um, particular example is the importance of supply chain management. Most of the impact for uh, a consumer goods company like Puma is upstream. It's the tier four suppliers. It's the people who produce the rubber, the leather, um, the petroleum products that go into footwear and, and sportswear. And partly, I, I think, a reflection of that, and I'll come back to my own organization here, is WWF is extremely um, interested in supply chain management as one of the responses to this uh, biodiversity crisis. We focus on those commodities that we think have the greatest impact on the planet, um, and we know that those are mainly agricultural um, and also forestry products and seafood products. Uh, because those are the, the, the products for which consumption is increasing very dramatically, and that's putting pressure on marine resources and terrestrial resources. And the way we approach that is essentially by trying to agree with producers, with retailers, manufacturers, traders, processors, investors, on what is good performance. Essentially, it's a kind of technological response. It's saying, can we agree on a low-impact or zero-impact production system? for these different commodities. And once we have that agreement across all these stakeholders, can we validate performance against that standard? And that's what certification is all about. So essentially, it's, it's trying to change the norms about what is acceptable production, and then at the same time, change the technology so that we get low impact or, or zero impact production in a way that is credible in the market. And we, We've worked over many years to develop, um, uh, with our partners, forestry st standards, uh, fishing standards, uh, palm oil standards, and we're increasingly expanding that into other commodities and other sectors, cotton, soy, sugar, beef, and so on. Um, lastly, uh, I don't know if Michael uh, Chen from PwC will, will have this information, because it's quite recent. I got this from Pavan. Um, we have... I guess there's a kind of uh, corollary to certification or eco-labeling. This is what happens when you take the eco-label and you put a price tag on it, right? When you say, okay, we can quantify all these, these different aspects of a footprint, greenhouse gases, biodiversity, water, and put it on the product. And it's, in a sense, it's taking an eco-label and going and turning it into almost a financial label of costs and impacts on the environment. I'm going to have to stop there because I've gone over time. There's lots more information available if you want, um, either from the, the TEAB website or you can buy the book, and I'd encourage you to do that. Um, that's all I wanted to say except uh, to um, acknowledge not just the donors of the TEAB project, but also that top line, the organizations that contributed um, to the TEAB for Business work. Um, we had a, a team, a core team of around 10, and I think 250 to 300 contributors overall to the TEAB for Business work. Thank you very much.